Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the latest edition of Argon Out Loud, the lab's public lecture series. Uh, my name is Alex Mitchell. I work in the uh, Communications, Education, and Public Affairs Division here at the lab. Tonight, we're very excited to be presenting Science and Cinema, featuring Dr. Mariusz Stan. Uh, Mariusz is a senior computational energy scientist here at the lab. Um, and of course, outside of the scientific world, many of you may recognize him as Bogdan Wallenitz, the car wash owner and one-time boss of protagonist Walter White on the Emmy award-winning TV show Breaking Bad. So um, before we bring Mariusz to the stage, we're going to show you a uh, brief video that provides some background on Mariusz's rather interesting story and also touches on some of the themes that he will cover tonight. So uh, thank you for coming and please enjoy. I have to say that I never thought I, I'm going to be acting in any movie or TV series. A few years ago, I joined my uh, children uh, for an audition for the pilot of uh, Breaking Bad. It was an exciting moment for them. Little did I know that it's going to be an exciting moment for me too. Uh, during that audition, somehow the production thought that uh, I might be a good choice for a character to say one line in the pilot. And then it happened that Vince Gilligan and the production liked me in that role and uh, Every season brought this character, Bogdan, the owner of the car wash, back for a little bit. I do believe that scientists and movie makers are creators, are people who are driven by curiosity, by the need to, to communicate knowledge in the case of scientists and emotion in the case of artists, of movie makers. Both fields are interested in developing and maintaining forces between atoms, in the case of the scientific uh, models I'm, I'm working on, or between characters and people in movie. And this attraction and rejection between entities is a theme that reoccurs in many of the scientific papers we published, and that can be retrieved in some of the movies I watched. And uh, I found it intriguing, interesting, and somehow uh, providing an unexpected link between science and cinema. So after all these, I, I would encourage everybody to go to an audition. If they are interested in being part of a movie, there is nothing more interesting than go there and try to be part of the moving making experience. I found it very, very rewarding. I also encourage people to try computational science. We run something that will give you uh, the sense of what we do as computational scientists. And uh, with that, maybe we will get more people interested in doing either of them or both of them. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Mario Stan. Good evening, everybody. I'm glad to be back home at Argonne National Laboratory and to be with you for uh, uh, this very interesting event. Let me thank uh, Alex Mitchell for inviting me and for organizing the event. I also would like to take this opportunity to share with you the fact that I have a recurring nightmare. I dream that I am a uh, at the Academy Awards ceremony, <laughs> and they hand me the Oscar for the best actor. And I'm giving my thank you speech. And I thank everybody, but I forget to thank my wife. <laughs> so thank you, Liliana, uh, for your support and your help. Uh, Liliana is a scientist at the lab. Now I feel way better. And uh, we can move on. Thanks to Sony Television Production for creating what some say is one of the best TV series ever. OK, so what do we know about Bogdan Wolinets? Uh, he, he was born in Romania, like me. He immigrated, came to the United States, like me. He's a nice guy who is confronted with very difficult situations and occasionally has to be mean to people. No comment about that. <laughs> there is a Facebook 
page dedicated to Bogdan's eyebrows. <laughs> you want to check that out. And there are uh, a number of uh, blog entries. Let's see. He doesn't look like a happy man. He's fairly old. I, I want to protest. People over 60 are fairly young. <laughs> he has a tumor. That's not true. His wife wants to move back to the old country. I don't think so, no. <laughs> His mistress needs a new car. That is true. <laughs> so when I get stopped on the street by people, uh, hey, Bogdan, may I take a picture of you? Oh, my God, oh, my God, uh, good show, congratulations. Very few people really know my name. My name is Marius Stan. I was born in Romania, as I said. I do a lot of uh, interesting uh, research in this area at Argonne, Northwest, and you can see that I have the word senior in most of my titles. <laughs> Part of it is because I have gray hair. And having, being a senior is not always good. You know, I played soccer when I was young. My friends would say, you are an outstanding soccer player. Now they say, you are a senior soccer player. My work as a scientist has some connection with the movie industry and with creating, telling stories about scientific issues, of course. And I invite you to join me this evening in creating together a scientific thriller called Bike Frame, kind of like Mad Men or an equivalent. In this thriller, we will investigate the frame of a bike made out of an aluminum alloy. So let's see what mysteries can we uncover. If you look at the bike frame, it looks so polished and shiny. Perfect, almost perfect. But if you have access to experimental microscopy, starting with optical microscopy and then using electron microscopy and high-resolution microscopy techniques, you could perhaps do what I'm trying to do, look inside the material that makes the bind frame and see if indeed it's as perfect as it seems. Now, we are already at 55, 50, 65 magnification, <coughs> And to my disappointment and yours, this material is not that perfect. There, is, there are cavities, some of them filled with gas, some of them void. And if this is due to, to the manufacturing process. And if we look either uh, even more in depth, zoom in, you'll see how precipitates are being formed small pieces of materials with a composition different than the original alloy. Like here and here. As we zoom in even more, and at some point change the type of microscopy technique, although it, it may not appear so to you, there is a new technology being used now. We are down to maybe 10,000 dimensions that are 10,000 smaller than a hair strain. We are in the world of microns, hundreds of microns. You can see this location, small cracks in this region. And with improved experimental techniques, we can see something that when I was in college, 30 years ago, it was impossible for anybody to see. The atoms, the bricks that make up this wonderful building, which is our universe, aligned by rows and columns in a very well-defined structure. Atoms, this network of atoms is not flawless either. There are sometimes vacations, atoms missing from a certain position, or interstitials, atoms that are in a position that is outside the, the primary sites on the lattice. 
As of today, we cannot look into the structure of an atom. We cannot see uh, the distribution of uh, electron density. But I bet that if somebody gives this talk 10 or 15 years from now, there might be ways for us to examine that uh, structure of the atom. So this is the type of research I'm engaged in, looking into properties of materials at various length scales and time scales. How about we together uh, move on to the first uh, episode of our scientific thriller, which I will call the script. Any enterprise needs a good plan, a good script. For those of you who never had access to the script of, script of a movie or of a TV series. Here is an example. You'll see that the writers, and by the way, Breaking Bad had outstanding writers, tell actors what to say. People will believe it, at least I worked here for four years. And even give them some hints, some indication about what to do. For example, Walt's not listening. His attention is elsewhere. Walt's point of view, a bushy eyebrowed man stands in the wipe down area. That would be me. <laughs> Berating an employee, that's something that I hate to do, but I have to. A good script is, in a sense, critical for conducting science. In science, we don't have uh, anything like we just saw for Breaking Bad, but we do follow the scientific method, which, in fact, says, make an observation, ask a question, about you, what you just observed. Formulate a hypothesis, then a model, make a prediction. Validate, make sure that your prediction represents reality. And if it doesn't represent reality, go back. Re-examine your hypothesis or your model until reality is captured in that experimental or theoretical or computational approach. I, I, I'm sure you recognize all these guys. If you don't, ask me after the talk. I'm Apparently, between, uh, if you look at theory, experiment, and computation, theory is far more fun. We also need tools, right? So we have a methodology. We know how to go about doing science or cinema, but we need good tools. I have here a, a, a picture of Michael Slovis, an outstanding cinematographer and also an exceptionally gifted director. He directed one of the episodes I was in in Breaking Bad. Mike would take extraordinary care in selecting the filters and the lenses that he's using uh, when he's shutting a, a, a scene. And he does that by examining what are the best regimes in terms of light intensity or contrast that are appropriate for that particular type of filter, for example. So he chooses filters and lenses depending on the scene, depending on what effect, light uh, effect, he wants to obtain. And so do we. In computational science, you have here a diagram that shows the tools, theoretical and computational tools that we are using across uh, length scales from nanometers to meters and time scales from picoseconds to seconds or even day, days. So how does this work? If I'm interested in looking at interactions between atoms, remember the rows and columns that I've shown, maybe I'm going to use density functional theory to investigate the electronic structure, or if I want to understand the forces between atoms, molecular dynamics. If my problem requires understanding the grains or the dislocations, remember the small cracks in the bike frame, then there is dislocation dynamics or phase field. But if I'm interested in what happens to the bike frame as a real object that you can keep in your hands and maybe bend or hit and see how it swells, then finite elements may provide uh, the necessary uh, information and may help me predict what will happen with the material. 
So it's not much different in the sense our lenses are, in fact, codes, pieces of software that we develop and use. You've seen a poster, I hope, uh, by Di Yun, Zigang Mei, and Latif Yakut about uh, uh, how a number of such tools can be used to understand and predict properties of uranium oxide. Here is a simulation using finite element methods in the area of computational fluid dynamics. In this simulation, scientists at Argonne National Lab uh, have examined the effect of the, the geometry of inlets on the type of fluid flow one can obtain in a certain uh, vessel for the purpose of understanding how to optimize the coolant in the nuclear reactor core. And let's start this simulation. And I invite you to observe how, in the case to your left, the geometry is such that the two flow channels do not interact almost at all, while to your right, a small change in the geometry will create a lot of mixing and additional turbulence. So using a piece of software, a code, something a little bit more complex or far more complex than the apps you download on your iPhone, scientists at, Nas at Argo National Lab are able to predict and examine scenarios related to behavior of fluid flow in a nuclear reactor. And this is important for people who care about nuclear reactors, but uh, I don't know how many of you own a nuclear reactor, so <laughs> may not be that in praise. So let me give you an example that's closer to your heart, or rather closer to your brain. Before we I move to that example, let's ask this question. Is a simulation that we do on a computer real, represents reality or not? At this very lab, there is an experimental setup that is capable of reproducing the, the environment and the, uh, the variables associated with that fluid flow simulation. These are the two inlets. One can change the geometry. These are the flow channels. With lasers and cameras, one can examine the result. And indeed, our simulations represent reality. They do. In fact, anything we can imagine is real, as Picasso said. And as I said, uh, if this is not compelling to you, let's see if an example connected to the brain blood vessels will make a better impression. Here is a work also done uh, at Argo National Lab in the Theory and Computational Science Division. This is a representation of blood vessels in the brain. And using computers, we would like to understand what, under what conditions some um, uh, illnesses, such as anemia, for example, or an aneurysm, may occur. But to do that, we cannot really uh, make a judgment based on information at a continuum level. We have to go into uh, the details of the blood flow at mesoscale. This cylinder represents uh, a segment of the blood flow, blood vessels of an artery. And these are red blood cells, although they are colored uh, differently to confuse you and, and me. Uh, they, they represent all red blood cells. Some of them you will see in the simulation which stick to the walls of the artery. And others will try to go through. As you can see, once there is a deposit created on the, uh, in this region, it is harder and harder for the cells to, to go through. And at some moment, uh, the blood flow is being blocked, partially or totally. So not only that the computational tools that we are using can expand our brain and help us understand the universe, if you want, the computational tools can help us understand the brain itself, at least at this level, the blood flow and the associated uh, phenomena. Another great post, uh, poster by uh, Joe Insley and his colleagues that I hope you, you had a chance to see. 
Moving along, uh, one needs a good team. For those of you who watch the World Cup, the soccer, uh, anybody here uh, happy with the result? Oh, yeah, or well, some? <laughs> Let me say that I was so proud of the team uh, we had, United States, maybe not uh, big celebrities, but however, a team that, that evolved very well. I think they, they did quite well. The importance of a team cannot be emphasized strongly enough. I was so happy to be part of, a, of the Breaking Bad family. Here we are at uh, the finale. We watched live the final episode at the Hollywood Celebrity Cemetery. That was really in a cemetery. It was a big lawn, a large uh, screen, a very quiet neighborhood. <laughs> We were with the, the, the cast, uh, the, the actors, you can see Aaron Paul, uh, uh, Brian Cranston. Uh, here I am with Vince Gilligan, the creator of the movie, the, the genius behind this uh, production. Uh, maybe you know that Vince uh, liked to direct the pilot and the last episode of each season. And he was very particular about every aspect of the show. He would select the sweaters I would wear in various scenes. He wanted to see all options and made a decision, this one or that one. Brian Cranston, again, an outstanding actor. This is my son, Tiberiu, who happens to be here. He's pursuing a, a PhD in material science and by coincidence, got time at APS for irradiation experiments. So uh, he's here and, and I'm glad to see him. Uh, I like to say Tiberiu is a, an improved version of me. A much improved version of me. Uh, my daughter, our daughter Patricia, who is a student in California and stayed there, she knew better. She, she didn't, wanna, didn't, didn't come to, to Chicago this time. Uh, Bob Odenkirk, you know, Saul. There's a spin off of Breaking Bad, maybe some of you know. Uh, uh, better called Saul. Uh, so, very, very interesting uh, event. It was a pleasure to reconnect, reconnect with uh, all the, the friends uh, and colleagues in Breaking Bad. And having a good team is also important for scientists. I want to stop the presentation and take this opportunity to thank all my computational scientist colleagues who accepted to prepare and present posters. Their work outstanding. I'm happy to be associated even remotely with them. So I'm going to stop and just say thanks to the poster presenters and congratulations for their work. OK, let's move on. Coordination, about coordination. If we have the tools, the team, everything, one must organize the activity in a way that is most efficient and productive. Here is a, a sample of a call sheet that we received every evening before the shooting day. In this example, you can see how Brian Cranston was instructed to show up for hair and makeup at 6.18. So it wasn't at 6 or sometime tomorrow morning. It was at 6.18. And he had to be on set at 7.18. Uh, Anna Gunn, who played Skylar, needed two hours for hair and makeup. <laughs> and uh, I was supposed to be there at 8.30. And this was not only for the actors who played various characters. Uh, six detailers who were washing cars were there, uh, were instructed to be at 6.15. One berated employee. <laughs> two cooks. Two waitresses. And I, I was profoundly impressed by this. I thought that artists are, have some, uh, 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 what should I say, a, a, a bohemian view of the world and they didn't care about anything. When in fact, they were very disciplined and well organized. Everybody depended on everybody else, the lights, the sound. Uh, the writers were on set all the time to see if actors will, would say the lines the way they imagined. So you know the writers wanted to see that what they created in their imaginations matched reality, represents reality or not. 
Now, coordination is also important in science. <laughs> now, if we, if, we, <laughs> if we stop joking about that, <laughs> let, me, let me remind you that as we are spending this wonderful evening together watching a scientific thriller, and uh, I, I, I'm sure everybody's on the edge of their seat about what happens with that bike frame, and other people are working right now in this very building at APS. There are experiments going on. They must be there perhaps overnight, or they need to go back to their room at the guest house and then show up at 5 a.m. to check up on their experiment. So science, too, requires a lot of discipline. So if I learned anything from this experience in Breaking Bad, was that for me, to be a, a creator that I want to be, innovative, free-spirited, thinking outside the box, I have to be very disciplined and well-organized in my daily life. So this was just a joke, don't, don't, don't think that. <laughs> and these people do not work at Argo National Laboratory. <laughs> uh, I mean, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Episode 5, facilities. We should... Uh, I thought of calling this actually facilities 3, or uh, the revenge of facilities, or something like, sounds like transformers, or... Because it's a very interesting topic. Here is the state of the art in movie making, in the movie industry. Albuquerque, New Mexico, is now raising up to the third place as uh, for, for uh, producers after New York and Los Angeles. New Mexico is mostly a desert, so it's less expensive to shut uh, films or TV series over there. In the particular case of Breaking Bad, there was another advantage. In New Mexico, you can find quite a number of people who are knowledgeable and appreciative of methamphetamine. So it was good, really, it was good for the show to, to operate there. And the show uh, made an impact on the local e economy. Uh, now I'm, I'm serious. Whenever I'm serious, I'm going to turn this down. So it made an impact on the local economy. Uh, the hotels thrived, the restaurants thrived. There was money being pumped in the economy of New Mexico. So they enjoyed that. Nowadays, if you go to Albuquerque, they give you a tour of the house where Walter and Skylar White used to live, of the place, if you pay extra, the place where they made the methamphetamine. You can uh, stop by the car wash that I used to own. <laughs> so it's quite, it's quite nice. Facilities matter a lot in science. And here at Argo National Lab, we are lucky to have some of the best in the world. You see, the advanced photon source that you all know, kind of a big, powerful X-ray machine that let let us, scientists, look into the structure of materials. Also, uh, accelerators, the Center for Nanoscale Materials, Leadership Computing, Electron Microscopy Center, where, in principle, one could make one of the movies similar to the one with the bike frame that I showed to you. But, you know, having facilities and being well organized and having a good team is perhaps not enough to, to develop outstanding science. There is one ingredient that must be present, and that is creativity, the ability to, to provide innovative solutions to problems, to make something new, unexpected, and of value. And Argon is a place to do that. Here's an example of an create, a creative approach to a simple problem, melting. Everybody who likes to have ice in their uh, uh, sodas or wine or uh, uh, bourbon knows about melting. Yes, ice cube melt. But how does melt proceed? How, how does it really happen? What's behind that? Do objects melt at once in the entire volume or how? Here's an example that uses gallium, a metal that has a melting temperature that's close to room temperature. In fact, it will melt in your hand, a piece of gallium. And you can see how regions of liquid and solid coexist. So from the experiment, we already learn that melting does not happen in the entire volume at once. 
But as a scientist, I cannot be satisfied with such uh, information. I would like to understand how m the, the liquid phase evolves and takes over the solid. And one cannot do that just looking at, at a piece of gallium. So we, would have, we, we thought of using molecular dynamics that was on my chart of methods, if you remember, to study the interaction between atoms. So this is a model where each atom, each gallium atom, is represented by a pink sphere. Please do not ask me why pink. It's, uh, and uh, uh, there are regions of liquid where the atoms are in a more disordered state, to, your le to the left and to the right to ensure periodical boundary conditions. And then there is a small region of solid where atoms are more are ordered in rows and columns. Remember the movie about the bike, atoms ordered in rows and columns. And we will uh, watch together a virtual melting of a virtual gallium metal. Let's see, I, I tried this numerous times, I get the same result. Uh, the temperature is a little bit above the melting temperature. So what should happen is that the entire region will become liquid. But not that fast. Look at the interface between the liquid and solid and see how that interface becomes more wider and wider, more and more diffuse. You see, the liquid is advancing. It's more, almost like a big country conquering uh, a smaller one. The solid is fighting for his, its life. I'm rooting for the solid right now. But the solid <laughs> tries hard to stay ordered, but the liquid is advancing from the right and from the left. So finally, after a lot of struggle and a lot of patriotic desire to defend their territory, the solid loses the battle, and everything becomes disorder, entropy wins. OK, so now we know not only that melting does not occur in the entire volume, but also that it occurs by two major mechanisms. The interface becomes wider, and the interface advances until the entire uh, object, the entire metal becomes liquid. So this way of gaining insight in what happens using computational methods, I think is pretty interesting and, I would say, innovative. <laughs> now, how do we calculate forces between atoms? You know, do I need to turn this? <laughs> All right. How do we calculate forces between atoms? It turns out that there is a way of capturing interactions between atoms through molecular dynamics by defining an interatomic potential, which is this blue line that you see. So you see the distance between atoms and the interatomic potential. For those of you who are mathematically inclined, uh, the force is calculated by uh, evaluating the, uh, the gradient or simply the derivative in, in a one dimensional space, for example, if you remember high school derivatives. So the derivative or the gradient of this interatomic potential will give you the force. These are two atoms in the red circles, and it kind of goes like that. I need to, to show you. So if you look at, if, if we are going to choose the atom to your left and in the origin of this coordinate system of coordinates, and the atom to your right here, the interatomic potential, the blue line, starts with a small, uh, rather small slope, and then dips down in a valley, and then come up, comes up fast to the other side. So the force to this end is, is going to be attractive, trying to bring the atoms together, while at this other end will be repulsive. You will try to, to, to separate them. Because they cannot be at equilibrium all the time, the two atoms will vibrate. Right? The higher the temperature, the higher the vibration. So this is how we calculate and evaluate forces and understand attraction and rejection in science. I'm going to turn the table to uh, uh, James Cameron to discuss how forces, attraction and rejection, and the desire to represent reality plays a role in movies. What are you saying, Jake? 
You knew this would happen? Because of the nature of this film, you know, with, a, with this alien clan, this alien culture, you know, we had a choice. We could do it with makeup, like it's always been done, you know, rubber appliance makeup. It would have looked horrible and it would have been boring and stupid and, you know, kind of blue actors running around in the rainforest in their underwear, you know, and a bunch of blue body paint. It would look terrible. Uh, and I wasn't interested in that. You know, if I was going to do this, I wanted to do it this way, which is with performance capture. But before he could do that, Cameron first had to make sure his technology could cross what's known in robotics and animation as the uncanny valley. Let's say this is an absolute human uh, and this is a, you know, kind of a talking moose. You know, as you approach human, our attraction to the character goes down. And then at the last second, just when you get to a true human look, it goes back up. Well, we needed to get on the far side of that dip in the response curve, which is called the uncanny valley. And we needed to get to the opposite side where we believed we don't have to necessarily believe that it's 100% photoreal and we don't have to necessarily, necessarily believe that they actually exist but we have to believe in them as emotional creatures. Okay, so I hope I, I was able to impress upon you that attraction and rejection are important and that there is a desire in the scientific and artistic communities to represent reality. To do that, one needs a good team, good tools, facilities, creativity, and sorry to say, lots of money. <laughs> so episode 7 is dedicated to funding, to money. In one of the Breaking Bad uh, uh, scenes that I, I, I had the, the immense pleasure of doing with Anna Gunn, who played Skylar, we were negotiating hard uh, an issue related to the car wash. No spoilers, I'm not going to say what. And uh, she made what uh, I thought, or my character thought, was uh, uh, an insensitive, insensitive offer, $800,000. Uh, and uh, I countered with $20 million. <laughs> you know, little did I know at the time the importance of this number. I'm now a director of an advanced modeling simulation program in Washington, D.C., and the budget of my program is $20 million. No, money is not everything. Sometimes it's far more important to get access to computational resources. So 20 million gigaflops, a flop is one operation per second. For those of you who like doing calculations, and I'm not going to stop anybody, uh, 20 million gigaflops takes you to petascale computing, so over 10 to the 15 operations per second. One of the best computers operating in tens of petascale, uh, uh, petaflops is Mira, hosted by Argonne National Laboratory. If you had a chance to see the poster by Ray uh, Baer and his colleagues about uh, the Argonne uh, Leadership Computational Facility, I'm sure you, you enjoyed it. If not, stop by on your way out. It tells you about what capabilities are available and what interesting research is being done with high-performance computing at Argonne. Now about the future. You can tell that we are approaching the end of my presentation. Whenever people don't know what to say, they talk about the future. In the future... <laughs> so about the future. Here, here is my opinion about what will happen in the next five years. First of all, I think the trend of producing energy in a way that is environmentally friendly will continue. So this figure does not say that you can purchase your power plant at Walmart. <laughs> it says that power plants will tend to be more and more environmentally friendly. I also believe that not, maybe not next year, but uh, the year after, we will start the Materials Genome Initiative that will create a knowledge base of experimental information, models, and uh, simulation data, allowing scientists and engineers to, to design new, better materials. I also believe that uh, digital manufacturing or additive manufacturing or 3D printing will reach a point where it will become available for almost everybody. It happens that in, uh, I live downtown uh, Chicago, and at the first floor of my building, there is a CVS. 
And then I am renting a place in Washington, D.C., and at the first floor there is a CVS. There are CVS a pharmacy uh, locations almost everywhere. I often, I don't know about you, but I often send pictures to CVS and go there and pick them up. They have high-quality printers. I can imagine myself in five years sending a 3D object to their 3D printer and going downstairs and picking it up. It could be a teacup, could be a fork. There are, however, ethical issues associated with this. And we can talk more if you are interested. But nobody can stop me from imagining what's going to happen in the future. I would like to see electrical cars, for example, that stop by power stations where you can buy gas, but also you can exchange your battery the way you exchange a propane tank. And this very laboratory is conduct conducting research that goes in that direction. Uh, uh, the innovation hub on energy storage here at Argonne uh, has a strategy, 555, five, five. maybe you heard about that, right? five times the power at one-fifth of the cost uh, in five years. That may allow us to indeed operate an electric car over 500 miles, why not? The research in that area is not dissimilar to what I showed you before. Again, the, the script we have in science applies almost invariably. Uh, here is uh, an, uh, a study of chemistry and stress in uh, the cathode of a lithium-iron battery. Uh, I believe the material is lithium-iron phosphate. This is the one. Uh, the scale here is uh, hundreds of nanometers. This is a, uh, uh, that region in the yellow rectangle. You see stripes of lithium-rich and lithium-poor regions. And the scientist is asking itself or herself, how do these form? like in the melting case. So are the stripes starting from the beginning and they become wider and wider? Or maybe there is a different mechanism. Here is what the simulation says. So in red is high lithium concentration, blue is low lithium concentration. You see the answer is quite different. In fact, there is a complex structure formed at the beginning that evolves into the striped structure of the material. So here again, with a computer, we learn not only what the properties of the final state are, but how the, the system evolved towards that state, towards that state. Another great poster by Mike Welland and Larry Curtis and his colleagues. Even farther in the future, we might have here at the lab work that can lead to a new way of transmitting and storing information. This is not my area of expertise. I had a great, uh, interesting discussion with Ule Heinonen, who I hope is here in the room. And he explained to me that the challenge here was to create a structure that looks, uh, no offense, like a hamburger, uh, two disks on top of each other, I be, uh, and uh, a layer in between. The two disks had magnetic properties that were quite different. The vorticity was different, the, the magnetic the orientation was different. And their problem was to estimate, to predict what would be the properties of this structure knowing the properties of the component. I'm a physicist, and although I don't work in that area, I would say that this system was, high, was likely to become unstable because it's so symmetrical and could go one way or the other. It turns out that simulations show, here we have magnetization on the y-axis, and the color scheme represents values on the x-axis. The simulations show that, in fact, in the, uh, the final, the structure will have properties that bring together the two orientations. So it's not one way or the other. It's a combination of the two. And this is called a mirror. Uh, Ule was so kind and explained to me what a mirror is, and I did understand it, but then I said, can you give me a brief explanation that I can use all the time? And he said, yes, a mirror is half of a skirmion. <laughs> so for everybody in the room, imagine a skirmion, and a mirror is half of that. <laughs> Again, we all work on these topics and believe, trust, that the world will be changed because of the results of our uh, studies here at Argonne or in collaboration with the universities nearby. I'm going to end 
with a topic, with a chapter, an episode for the students in the room. About education, the most hated topic for any young person, right? I have two kids, two children, no young adults. They don't want to talk about education. They don't want to get advice. Bad luck. <laughs> This is my take on the future of education. I think arts and sciences will diffuse into each other even more. I know for a fact that students who pursue degrees in science, like Tiberio and Patricia, are taking art classes. My daughter, she took a class on the physics of musical instruments. Uh, Tiberio took a class on uh, the physics of surfing. Because at Santa Barbara, surfing is an art. <laughs> Now, as they do that, of course, they will develop skills. And we all did through our elementary school, high school, college. Well, developing skills is very important and will continue. There is something else that is coming up. When I was a student, when I did my PhD, There was a requirement. You could not get a PhD unless you had two or three published papers. Now I see how that is moving towards undergrad. You want to get into a good PhD program, you need to be engaged in research and even co-author, if possible, a paper as an undergrad student. If you are a student in arts, you need to have an, uh, participate in an art event, be present in your community. Otherwise, people don't take you seriously anymore. So, Developing skills, adding knowledge is important. Making an impact on society early on is perhaps even more important. So I'm going to end with advice, and a piece of advice for the students in the room about an important topic. I know they don't want to get advice. As I said, there is no way you can get out of this room and, or turn off the mic. So here it is, and I'm going to express my advice in the language that I know best. I'm a computational scientist. Programming. So if you like to create something, be a scientist or an actor or a writer, an author, or a composer. But if you like to serve society, then be a fireman or a soldier or a doctor or a professor. If you like to tell other people what to do, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you read this one. But whatever you do, do it with all your heart. Thank you for your attention. Thanks again for coming out. Uh, we're going to open up to questions and answers now. So there are uh, people circulating around the main level and also on the balcony. If you have a question, just raise your hand. They'll, uh, they'll get a mic to you. So. Uh, Thank you for this wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering, how, what would be your advice for getting people interested in science and you know, compu theoretical computation? <laughs> I'm very sorry, can you? Uh, sorry, uh, I was wondering what your advice would be to get more people interested in science and oh. theoretical computation. <laughs> I see. No, I mentioned that young people, or people of all ages, don't like to be advised, to receive advice. So I, th I don't think we should advise them in any way. What we could do is to make science more appealing to them, to demonstrate that uh, all the scientists in the room are cool people. <laughs> they, they may not have uh, piercing or earrings, or, but they are very cool people, and they do so many interesting activities outside their profession or during their research, making them spectacular. It's just, Perhaps the, the advertisement is not as good as it could be. And I've given a number of presentations like this one, and every time I tried, either at a university or a professional society or at the Chicago Cultural Center, I tried to, to send this message that science is something important, rewarding, and cool. And that this, inter, uh, this diffusion, interdiffusion between science and art is something that everybody should try to be part of. And with time, without no piece of advice, more and more people will join us in, in, in science and engineering, I, I believe. Hello. Um, Hello. Within the theme of the presentation, what would you say, just as an independent filmmaking 
he has an important role of art um, in respect to creating something that's new or stuff that's never been seen before. How would you, what would you say would be equivalent in science um, using good methods, but just finding ways to ask or resolve questions that have never been asked or answered before or trying to find different approaches to modern problems will be equivalent to that. Okay, um, so I live downtown Chicago, not far from uh, one of the locations of Columbia University where a number of uh, people are pursuing degrees in art, some of them cinematography, some of them other forms of art. And I had a, uh, the opportunity to talk with some of, uh, of these young guys and I see that they're interested in technology to a degree that shocked me. Uh, a young fellow was studying digital photography and he knew about digital photography more than I did. And I'm not that bad with, with, with that topic, but he knew far more. He was uh, familiar with software that can help him uh, modify the images, combine them, uh, create effects, turn uh, a simple shot into a masterpiece, preparing, uh, uh, preparing himself for using even more technological aspects. So I would say that uh, although the methods we use in computational material science may not make an impact on your work directly, look up what other type of computation can assist you, can improve upon what you do, and try and learn it or team up with people who are experts in that area. Uh, you know, uh, James Cameron, when they made Avatar, they used a, a cluster of Hewlett-Packard machines. At the time, 10, 15 years ago, that was a big deal. Nowadays, it doesn't mean that much. But they were at the fraud, uh, forefront. They un he understood that by using computers, he can create something in a few years that will take him perhaps to uh, an Academy Award, to an Oscar. He was ahead of his time. And you should try to do the same if you can. By the way, thanks very much. I really enjoyed your lecture. I have to ask this, though. What is your most memorable moment on Breaking Bad? <laughs> oh, okay. you mean uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the series or on the set or? Either one. OK, most memorable moment. Hmm. Hard to, to, to classify them, to rank them. Um, I'm going to give you a few examples. I'm not going to choose one of them. Uh, when Vince Gilligan, for example, called me and said, uh, we have decided to modify the script of the pilot. Take your time, read it, and tell me if you are fine with this. For those of you who saw the pilot, uh, it was a tough decision. Uh, then, um, the interaction with Brian Cranston and one of the tips he gave me. He was very kind and tried to help me. He knew I was not a professional actor. I never took acting classes. So one of the things he said was, uh, you don't have to speak that loud. <laughs> you can whisper. They have good microphones. So as a result, I went in and uh, did that uh, makes cashiers wash, wipe down cars even if they don't want to. So that was a very, very good, an outstanding moment. The interaction with the directors. I remember three directors I worked with who could not be more different. Michelle McLaren, for example, will take uh, Anna Gunn and myself in her, in her trailer and we would practice the lines. We would say the lines and at some moment she would be pleased and say, okay, this is how I'm gonna do it. Uh, David Slade, for example, who also directed uh, one of the uh, in installments of the Vampire uh, series, right? What, what? Which one? Twilight, yes, right. Twilight 3, I think. He, he was a very joyful, bubbly man, he is, and he would like to take five or six takes in a different way. So I was Bill Burr, for example, and you say, Marius, can you be upset? And Bill, you are kind of cheerful. And then, uh, Bill, you, you are just uh, leveled, and Marius, you are very angry at him. So we would do that, and at, during editing, he would select the scene that he liked the best. Michael Slovis, 
that I showed a picture of uh, with the filters, Michael Slovis would not give us any direction. In that scene with Brian Cranston, he would say, you are actors, you know better, just do it. We will do it, then we'll, he will come and say, let me do some fine tuning. Uh, can you turn to the right a little bit, and uh, can you, Brian, uh, speak a little bit uh, louder, if you can? And, and then we will do it and say, oh, okay, that, that was very good. So, so many styles. So I would say that perhaps the most memorable aspect was this collective memory of working with the directors and with the actors. Pieces, it's like a puzzle, pieces of uh, information, of, images, sounds that, that come from that. I rem fondly remember all of them. That's what I wanted to say. Hello. Uh, my question is, um, since Breaking Bad is a show that has a, uh, a lot of science and physics within the show, were you happy with how the science of, um, I guess, Walt's uh, meth cooking was represented? <laughs> sure. OK. Everybody heard the question? The science in, in, in the show was uh, completely wrong. <laughs> that was on, somehow on purpose. The producers don't want people to learn how to make methamphetamine by watching Breaking Bad. <laughs> Let me remind you, if you're interested in making methamphetamine, that I have a PhD in chemistry. <laughs> so, that was a joke. So. <laughs> No, I was not consulted on scientific topics. They had their people who were working with about that, such that the process looked realistic and convincing. And uh, another aspect is that I never told them that I am a scientist. And for a long while, nobody knew until they found out and celebrated. Uh, <laughs> Similarly, I did not tell my colleagues at Argon National Lab after I was hired in building 208 on that hallway where my office is. Anything, and for, I'm not kidding, for one year, nobody knew anything. One day, one of them violently opened my, <laughs> the door of my, I saw you on TV last night. <laughs> I was watching this, I couldn't believe it, and I said, I work with that guy. He's <laughs> right next to me. So, yes, yes. I, I have to say I enjoy it a lot. I, I've learned a lot, but I was not consulted as a scientist at all. I'm curious what factors you think are going to either impede or enhance uh, getting the Material Genome Project going. <laughs> No, I'm a computational scientist, with, and I've, most of my work is on materials, so computational material science. So I have a firm uh, opinion about this. I hope I'm not disappointing anybody. I think that the Material Genome Initiative is poorly defined. And that is one of the, the, the reasons it didn't make much project, um, progress. Sorry. There is some confusion about what creating a materials genome means. And you know, in science, confusion sometimes helps. Having different opinions, science is not a democracy. You cannot vote about who's right about a topic. The person who has the most outrageous, outrageous opinion who could be the right one. In this case, though, I believe that at some moment to have a national initiative, there should be a consensus of of the boundaries of this initiative. And I, I'm telling you this because we often hear people talking about materials uh, genome initiative and referring to concepts that are very different and uh, cannot be brought together at all. For example, the comparison with the human genome initiative is not truly valid. What one can do for materials can not follow directly the example of the Human Genome Initiative, which was, which, which was an extraordinary success. So that was the answer to your question, that why, what impedes, why isn't this happening uh, faster? There is another aspect. Uh, the, 
the politics of this, the funding. Uh, maybe you'll be surprised to know that Matthias' genome as a concept was uh, copyrighted by a number of people almost simultaneously at some universities, then was then uh, uh, somehow absorbed or, and used by, uh, by the administration. So my hope is that the need for building such a knowledge base will be so powerful that all of us will come together and say, okay, what is a reasonably, reasonable way of going about it? Uh, can we develop a strategy at the national level? Can we allocate appropriate funding? And it will happen. And you know why? Because I imagine that. And everything we imagine is going to be reality in a few years. But it's not going to be easy. I'm optimistic, though. You talked earlier about the moral issues of 3D printing. I was wondering if you'd be willing to expound on that a little bit. Yes. Uh, you know, it would be nice uh, to, to print uh, downstairs at the CVS uh, teacup or a fork, as I said, or a pen or a mouse. But some people might use 3D printing, for example, to print a gun and bullets. And that may open the door for, for a very dangerous type of society. So it's nice to be able to, to create, to manufacture parts in home. But how far can one go without before becoming dangerous? And that I'm not saying that it's, it's bad to have guns or bullets. It's, I'm saying it's bad to have people printing them at home. There are other examples, too, but that was, I think, one of the, the important issues that relate to the ethics of not only of 3D manufacturing, but of creating opportunities for individuals to, to make parts in, a, in an unregulated way. All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Um, thank if you, you. If you didn't get a chance to get a picture with Mariusz uh, before the uh, presentation, he will be out in the lobby, so there will be an opportunity to, to get a picture with uh, Bogdan. Okay. So thanks, everybody, Thank for coming. You.